I'm Ms. Hottie from Olympian High School, and today I'll be using the Traditions and Encounters textbooks, Chapter 11, to help you study family and society in Roman times. So family is a group that um, socializes you, that helps you understand sort of the spoken and unspoken, the implicit sort of rules of behavior in a particular culture. And when we talk about society, we're also looking at other groups. So groups, for example, by occupation, by wealth, for example, if you're upper class or lower class, if you're a slave. So when we talk about social things, we're looking at things having to do with groups of people and how they interact, how they behave, for example, men as a group, women as a group, other genders, because um, some do exist. And so that's what we're looking at. So whenever, when, we, when you're, say, for example, filling out an inspect chart, interactions between humans and the environment, social, political, economic, cultural, technology, you know, and you're on that social category, the three top things you want to look for is what are families like? Uh, what are the different occupations like? Um, you know, is there a big difference between it, what women do and what men do? And then like look for nuances, which are subtle or small things that are different. For example, is there a difference between urban women and rural women, between urban slaves and rural slaves? And try to like compare and find those things. Okay, so with that, you're taking notes potentially on an inspect chart in the social part of the inspect chart or on a separate piece of paper and you can transfer your notes over. The first thing you want to look at is the relationship between men and women. And you should know that Roman law placed a lot of power into the hands of men, immense authority into the hands of men. So the male heads of families were called the pater familias. And the, the male head of the family didn't have to be the father. It could, be, for example, if the father died, it would be the eldest male in the household. So the entire family consisted of the slaves as well, free servants, close relatives, people who lived together. And overruling all of them was the pater familias, so the father of the family, but again, it didn't have to be the father, it could just be the eldest son. This person had tremendous power, the ability to, for example, force his children to marry whoever he wants them to marry, to determine the work and duties they would perform, and to punish them, even going as far as killing them. That was within his legal rights. He also had the right to sell them into slavery, as I mentioned, also to execute or kill them. Okay, so the pater familias is incredibly powerful, but most of the time being given or endowed with the, these powers didn't mean that he ruled tyrannically over his charges. Women often had considerable amount of power within the domestic sphere, the domicile, the home, especially by the time they reached middle age, they often were responsible for arranging marriages for their kids or in dealing with the finances of the household. Now, technically, Roman law was set up in a way to limit the amount of inheritance that women could get, the amount of wealth and, and land that they could inherit. But there were so many loopholes, which were basically ways to get around the law that it ended up being that what was supposed to happen, what actually happened were two vastly different things. And so women did accumulate quite a lot of money during the third and uh, second centuries BCE. So remember, we're going, you know, to zero. So um, as the Roman expansion brought a lot more wealth into the capital, and people came to have a lot of money. So that by the first century BCE, um, so here we're talking still BCE, so this is before zero, so it would be like 100 to 1 BCE before zero. Um, yeah, that's the, the first century. So even though there was a lot of power given or vested into the pater familias, many women had substantial estates and businesses. And all of this new wealth was not just unique to women. Of course, the, of the expansion of the Roman state brought a lot of new wealth accumulation for new groups of people, people like merchants who were buying and selling things, landowners, and construction contractors. And this is going to have an effect. They're going to start to enjoy these new classes of beautiful palatial houses, so like a palace with gardens and, and, and lavish banquets with things like uh, tree fungus and boiled ostrich you can read here. Meanwhile, most people were dining on basic foods like porridge and vegetables. Every once in a while, they might have access to meat, proteins, but really very basic sustenance. Now, by the first century BCE, so uh, remember we're talking 100 to the year 1 BCE, this is a huge problem. There is a big disparity, a difference between the lifestyle of the rich and the lifestyle of the poor. And the people who are poor are often, um, you know, they're unemployed, even some of them, and they're, you know, receptive to 
things like rioting to express their dissatisfaction and desire for improved conditions. And some of them were easily recruited by the generals Mar Marius and Sulla, who we talked about earlier, Ms. Robeson talked about earlier. Um, this was during the time of the civil wars that were taking place in um, in, in Rome. So this is destabilizing. The effect is it's destabilizing. Now, the imperial authorities, the government of Rome, never really addressed this problem of poverty for the masses. Instead, they tried to keep them happy or contented with a policy that they called bread and circuses. Bread and circuses referred to grain, subsidized grain, meaning grain that was cheap so that the poor wouldn't rebel, and public entertainment, so things like the gladiator fights and the, um, you know, the races, chariot races. Nowadays in politics, you might read a newspaper article that refers to something as bread and circuses. This is an allusion to the Roman bread and, bread and, bread and circuses, which are things that keep the general population content to the point where they don't make a fuss or rebel or it doesn't destabilize society. So some, we, you could argue about what that is in our modern day and age. Some people might say as long as the gas prices are low, people don't get too upset, even though there's a huge gap between what the rich are making and what most of us are making. So you can kind of play with that idea yourself. What would be the modern equivalent of bread and circuses in today's day and age? Now, slaves are another big group in society. And by the second century, so again, I'm trying to define things. This time it's CE, so it's after zero. So second century CE would be two, actually 101, because remember the first century is one to 100, right? One to 100. So the second CE, and then the second century would be 101 to 200 CE. I need you guys to learn this because this is a big problem for kids. They never quite understand. And sometimes they, they just assume it's the second century. So let's start with the twos. No, you got to start with the ones, 101 to 200. So by that time, slaves comprised a large part of the Roman populace. Some say up to one third of the population. That's one out of every three people is a slave. Now there's a difference though between slaves in the countryside and slaves in the urban areas. So if they were in the countryside, conditions were horrible. They often worked on latifundia or they worked on state. Uh, quarries and mines, harsh conditions. Sometimes they were chained together, and this this led to, of course, huge discontent or unhappiness, which also which then led to large scale revolts. One of the most famous of which was a um, slave revolt, slave revolt led by a man named Spartacus that took eight legions of the Roman army to dispel. And there's a movie that I've watched about this. We'll watch like thirty seconds of it. There's also, a modern version of this, which I haven't seen. It's actually 73 BCE. Three Roman armies have been destroyed by Spartacus. Spartacus, a motion picture unequaled in the entire history of filmmaking, unlikely ever to be served in the tenderness and beauty of its love story. Nothing was spared to make Spartacus the superb achievement it is. Neither time, nor money, nor talent. For in Spartacus, you will see the finest cast ever assembled. Okay, so obviously they're selling it hard. You guys can watch it and determine for yourselves if it's as fine of a film as they claim. It's a good one to watch. Um, but here there's uh, some, I remember I told you I wanted you to compare, like while we're, while we're discussing to discern the differences between groups. Here, this paragraph, they're making it very clear that conditions for slaves in the cities were much better than conditions for slaves in the countryside. If you were a female slave, you often worked as a servant, domestic servant, whereas men would work as servants or laborers, craftsmen, shopkeepers. And if you were educated, you could live a pretty nice life. The first century Anatolian, that means from Turkey, slave, Epictetus became a very prominent or well-known Stoic philosopher. I love looking at philosophy. I hope you guys do too. Epictetus is fascinating. And I'll give you just like a 30 second like preview into his thoughts and you can go up and look, look, look him up some more. So Epictetus, a lot of what he says is applicable to our modern life. For example, he talks about, you know, life being like, um, like a roll of dye and you don't, you're not always, you, you can't always be like, um, you get what you get and really you can make yourself miserable or you can make yourself happy but it's about how you control your thoughts so we as humans have the ability to manage our thoughts and to um, monitor the internal discourse the dialogue that happens in our mind to achieve peace and happiness that achieve peace and happiness doesn't come from external validation say through instagram or facebook or whatever you guys are using these days TikTok. that it comes from inside and that you have the ability to control that. And one of the ways to do that is to 
try to focus on so small things and like accepting those small things without reacting to them in a very negative way. So if somebody spills milk, for example, who cares? Somebody steals some of your wine. Of course, you wouldn't drink wine because you're young, but like to take it easy and to consider that the price of tranquility. Um, and there's another Epictetus quote that I researched right before this lecture so that I would share it with you guys. Here's really a cool one. And talking about not being lazy, basically, and deciding to have mastery over your life. So decide now that, dang it, I messed up that you are worthy of living as a full-grown man who is making progress and make everything that seems best to be a law that you cannot go against. And if you meet with any hardship or anything pleasant or reputable or disreputable, then remember the contest is now and you cannot put things off anymore and that your progress is made or destroyed by a single day and a single action. And just a really cool way of thinking about being responsible for your own happiness, not getting caught up in social validation, not getting caught up in things being negative. Like you have control over your thoughts. So an alternative way of living as a philosopher. And he was a slave and yet he was very prominent and he was, you know, speaking with the most powerful intellectuals of his time and addressing large audiences. Now, counterparts is a word I really want you to learn. A counterpart is someone that does what you do in a different place. So people that are your equals or your equivalents in another place. Um, so so more than your count, their counterparts in the rural areas, so the urban slaves, their counterpart would be countryside slaves. They had more opportunities for like living an easier life and potentially having manumission, which is being freed from slavery. Manumission is like when you're released from slavery. It was common practice for people who were urban slaves to be released from slavery around the age of 30. But until then, they were, of course, under the strict authority of the patrofamilias who could even kill them. But this was a common practice in the city area. I hope that gives you a little bit more clarity around what the society was like in Rome at this time.